Hi, I'm Maria Gleemore, and I'm a social epidemiologist and the program director for the PhD program in epidemiology and translational science uh, here at UCSF. And I want to talk to you today because um, uh, one of the self-effacing jokes in epidemiology is if you become an epidemiologist, nobody will know what you do. They'll assume you work on skin diseases. And although it is true that epidemiologists, some epidemiologists do work on dermatologic conditions, actually epidemiologists work on all kinds of different conditions and diseases that influence population health. Um, when I was in college, I learned a bit of stats, a bit of math, a fair bit of biology, um, but I learned almost no epidemiology per se. What I didn't realize was that some of the most interesting applications for the statistics that I would ever encounter would be related to public health problems. For example, why do some groups have an infant mortality rate that's basically twice as high as other groups? And why has that inequality persisted over a century? Why has cardiovascular disease mortality declined so dramatically since 1960? And why are people born in some parts of the country at much higher risk of having stroke than people born in other parts of the country? Those are the kinds of questions that epidemiologists address, and those are the kinds of questions that I find most fascinating for uh, applications of statistical tools. So what is epidemiology? Uh, epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determ of determinants of health across populations. We study both the disease frequency and what influences disease frequency across populations. So it's helpful often to contrast epidemiology with medicine or clinical care, because a lot of people think if they really want to improve uh, the health, of, if they want to improve population health, what they should really do is become a physician or a clinician. So clinical care thinks about why is this individual sick and what made this person uh, ill? Whereas epidemiology thinks about why is this group of people at higher risk of becoming sick rather than this other group of people? So epidemiologists organize themselves often based on focusing on particular outcomes because it's important to understand the biology of particular diseases. And so some epidemiologists really focus on infectious disease. So for example, HIV or Ebola. Some epidemiologists focus on cardiovascular disease, stroke, because cancer and cardiovascular disease are leading killers in the United States. Many um, epidemiologists focus on cancer epidemiology. Um, it doesn't just have to be things that we conventionally think about as diseases. For example, injury epidemiology is a very important domain of epidemiology and some of the most uh, remarkable progresses in public health have been made and the, relating to injury epidemiology in the last 40 years. Um, it's also important to think about certain populations. So sometimes people organize themselves by focusing on the particular health needs of certain populations. So um, epidemiology of aging, older adults have particular uh, combinations of comorbidities that make it important to think about the population and how particular health issues affect them. Reproductive epidemiology, lots of people focus on the needs of um, reproductive age populations and things like access to contraception, access to abortion, and how those inf that influences uh, uh, the health of women and their children. Um, and of course, some people in focus on exposure. So they really define themselves based on what are the factors that influence health. So for example, environmental epidemiology. Lead, it turns out, influences lots of different domains of health outcomes. So people will focus on different um, environmental factors. Um, and uh, nutritional epidemiology, which somehow makes the papers all the time um, because everybody makes decisions about what to eat and, and we think that those are very influential decisions for health. And social epidemiology, and that's my domain, social epidemiology. So what is social epidemiology? You might ask, what isn't social epidemiology? This is a quote from Nancy Krieger, who's one of the leading social epidemiologists. And she says, is not all epidemiology social epidemiology? Is there any biologic process that's ever completely devoid of social context? Are there any social processes that influence health that are not mediated by the corporal reality of our profoundly generative and mortal bodies? Uh, I.e., social processes influence health through physical processes and the biology of, body, of human bodies. And so we have to understand the intersection of these two things to really understand what shapes health. So that's a fair complaint that all epidemiology is social epidemiology, but it is really helpful to think specifically about social processes as a set of risk factors. And this is a definition of social epidemiology from George Kaplan. He de describes it as the epidemiologic study of the role of behavioral, social, psychological, economic, cultural, racial, ethnic, and social structural factors in the occurrence of health problems 
in groups and populations, and then the development of risk factors that contribute to these problems. That's a pretty big purview for social epidemiology, but you can see why it's important to actually have expertise in social factors and how they become physical. So I want to give a little bit of segue to say why I personally found social epidemiology so compelling. When I was trying to decide what to do with my career and what to focus on, there were many, many domains of epidemiology I thought were extremely fascinating and really thought were important and could make a difference in the world. But there were a few things that made social epidemiology especially compelling. This is an article that I read when I was uh, trying to choose my own focus professionally. And uh, it was in the New York Times, and this was in 2001. And it's an article about a cosmetic, this is the title, Cosmetic Saves a Cure for Sleeping Sickness. There's a medication um, that is essentially the best available cure for what was called sleeping sickness. Um, trypanosomiasis, and this is a devastating illness that caused incredible early mor mortality um, in very impoverished populations in Africa, and it influenced thousands upon thousands of people every year. The medication was the best possible medication and essentially could cure the disease. However, we were about to stop making it because the people who get the disease had no money to pay for the drug. Essentially, this medication was going to go out of production and nobody could access it um, until it was discovered that the medication had a second use. And that second use was that it reduced facial hair in women. That meant the drug had a new life and um, uh, it began to be produced in order to sell it as a product for um, uh, wealthy women to reduce facial hair. And since they were making it anyway, the company was willing to provide it essentially for free to um, populations in low-income populations in Africa. So this to me was a pretty, and you can still buy products that include this medication, and uh, that's a great thing, um, it's still available. And, uh, but this to me was pretty compelling about why social processes are so important. We can make all the technical progress in the world, and it won't solve the health problems unless we understand, unless we link those health problems to social processes that regulate things like distribution of resources. This kind of challenge is why we see globally up to a 40 year gap in life expectancy. So if you look across the world and you just compare, if a baby born here, how long does that, would we expect that baby to live versus a baby born in another place, you see a 40 year gap. And although it's tempting to think that that's only relevant um, internationally, those kinds of inequalities also prevail in the United States. And so if you look across counties in the United States, you also see huge differences in um, life expectancy between very wealthy counties and very poor counties in the United States. And here, are, here is a map showing different counties um, for both white men and white women. You see similar inequalities when you look across other racial ethnic groups. And um, these gaps are pretty tragic and appalling. And they really seem to be essentially along social lines not really along the biological line, not along thing, lines that need to be biological. So that's why I found social epidemiology so important and so compelling. How do we think about the social determinants of health and how do we think about intervening on the social determinants of health? There are lots of frameworks for thinking about how social factors become physically embodied. And this is one such um, framework. There are lots of alternatives. But most of them emphasize that there are multiple levels if you think about health at the bottom level. Really, health is a physical experience, so everything that, gets, that influences health must go through a physiologic process, and that shapes, the biology shapes how the social factors influence health. But you can think about what, it, what shapes those, the, the, those biological processes. Well, certainly, medical care does matter. Um, we think that medical care shapes lots of biological processes, especially in the United States. If, you're, if you have an illness, medical care makes a big difference for many illnesses. Behavioral factors also clearly influence biology, and we all know that um, from kind of popular media. Um, but those behaviors actually are also very much shaped by the living and working conditions that we experience. So where we live, where we work, where we go to school, the built environment, um, the social context really shapes the kinds of behaviors. It's not chance that some populations are very unlikely to engage in lots of physical activity, whereas other populations are very good at adhering to physical activity recommendations. Those are really shaped by the social context that either facilitates or makes it difficult to engage in healthy behaviors.
the social context is itself shaped by a set of economic and social policies and opportunities. And that's a larger macro context that, that puts those processes into, into play. Now, importantly, these links are not laws of gravity. They are not, they, are, they can be broken, and they can be broken by sets of policies or interventions that make it so that being poor does not necessarily mean that it compromises your health so profoundly. And actually, one of the interesting domains of research is how, um, how much inequality in health there is between people who are kind of at the top of the socioeconomic ladder in a, in a society versus at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. And what you'll see if you look cross-nationally is that almost every place there is an inequality in health, such that people who are high, have high socioeconomic status have better health, and people with lower socioeconomic status have worse health. But in some places, that inequality is much narrower, and in some places, it's very large. So why do social factors influence health? What do we actually, how could this happen? So I work a lot on education, and um, I'm going to talk about education and some potential mechanisms that we think education, uh, via which we think education influences health. And I want to say these are very large and, and um, big picture uh, pathways, and the, an important aspect of epidemiology is understanding the details of the biology for how um, any particular social factor gets influences a particular disease. And there may be distinct pathways for what influences disease onset, what influences disease progression, and what influences the consequences of disease. Because of course, you can live with a chronic condition and have it not really impair uh, meaningful activities of daily living or your meaningful social roles. Um, so there are lots of distinct processes thinking about these three categories of outcomes for any particular health condition. But education is particularly important and powerful because it influences a lot of um, su subsequent social factors. Education, of course, influences what kinds of jobs you can have, um, how much money you make, how much wealth you accumulate. Education also very profoundly influences your social network. It influences who you marry, who your friends are, who you can call to bail you out of jail, who you can call to help you get a job, and who you can call for advice when you have your uh, diagnosis of a major condition. Education also mostly confers some knowledge. We Most people learn some things from, from school, and so you learn a little bit that might be factually useful um, in pr promoting your health. Probably more important than the facts that you learn are you learn a set of cognitive skills. So for example, education helps promote literacy, and literacy, it turns out, is a very important tool to accomplish all kinds of health goals. So for example, if you become sick and you need to navigate the medical system, literacy is very important, as is numeracy. Education also probably conveys a set of kind of softer skills that are around self-efficacy and optimism that you can solve sets of problems. Um, how do those things influence physical health? Well, it turns out those things influence um, lots of mechanisms that, that can influence disease, incidence, progression, or other consequences. One thing are actual physical toxins. So of course, occupational settings shape the kinds of physical toxins that you're exposed to, as do um, as we saw lead water crisis in Flint, we saw that, that where you live, education and, and poverty can influence where you live and your exposure to really horrible toxins like lead. Um, these mechanisms also influence a set of health behaviors. It's not just do you know that you should engage in those health behaviors, but also do you have the resources to overcome the health bar the barriers to engage in those, in those behaviors. But also, do you have the resources to overcome barriers? A lot of times I think, well, I really should exercise, but I'm very tired today, and I only have one job. If I had two jobs, and those jobs were manual labor, I bet I would be even more tired and less likely to exercise, even if I knew it was useful. So um, social factors also influence really straightforward things like infections. It turns out those social networks that I mentioned about who you marry, they also influence who you have sex with, which really influences your exposure to infectious diseases. Those networks are very powerful um, in terms of uh, all kinds of infectious um, conditions. Uh, medical access is also influenced, medical care access. And they're also one of the most interesting and really dynamic um, areas of epidemiology that's currently unfolding is the, the effect of psychological experiences on physical health. So experiences of stress, chronic stress, shame, um, stigma, these things probably influence your health in lots of ways that we don't fully understand. This is really an active area of science, um, but they seem like they're probably quite important. Um, and all of these are mechanisms by which education can influence health. 
So it's easy to see how education might be important, but how do we actually provide compelling empirical evidence on how education influences health? As a public health person, I don't just want to understand what's happening. I want to know how can I change it? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I do, which is on Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and cognitive aging. So Alzheimer's disease is um, probably the most common cause of dementia. It's most common in older adults, and it causes a progressive uh, loss of memory and cognitive um, function. We've known for a very long time that Alzheimer's disease and um, any kind of dementia is less common in people with more education. People at all levels of education do develop Alzheimer's disease, and it's uh, really quite common in, in all groups. But there's a marked social gradient such that people who have less education are more at risk. That's true in almost every setting that we've looked at, and it's remarkable even in extremely settings with extremely different levels of education. So if you contrast rural China, where the high education group has perhaps three years of education, the low education group has zero years of education, versus, for example, the nun study where they enrolled only nuns in the um, upper Midwest in the United States and the high education group had PhDs and the low education group had bachelor's degrees, you see similar patterns where people with more education are protected from cognitive aging and dementia risk compared to people with less education. This is an image from the Rotterdam study. It's, a, it's an important cohort in the Netherlands where they followed older adults in living in Rotterdam. And what they showed is that for different types of dementia, they could see a very similar pattern where if you look um, on the furthest over at total dementia, you see this very clear gradient that people with the lowest level of education, they put it in the uh, categories one, two, three, and four, people with the lowest levels of education have the highest risk of total dementia and people with the highest levels of education have the lowest risk. And that's true for Alzheimer's disease and also for vascular dementia, another major cause of dementia. So we know that this association is there, and I could have put 15 other studies, results from many, many other studies, showing essentially the same pattern. The Rotterdam study had it in the next picture. But just because there's an obvious injustice, like excess dementia risk in people with low education, doesn't mean that there's an obvious solution. We need to know more. Are the associations between low education and Alzheimer's disease actually causal? That is to say, if we increase the years of education or we increase the quality of education that everyone achieved, could we expect to actually reduce the burden of Alzheimer's disease for those people? If education were on medication, we could prescribe it randomly. We could have a randomized controlled trial, essentially run an experiment, and we could give some people a higher education and some people lower education, and then follow them up to see who got more Alzheimer's disease. We might have to wait 60 years, but at least we could conceptualize that. We can't do that really with education because we can't really randomize education and then wait 60 years. So how do we find convincing evidence that it's causal? It's not enough just to say, well, people with low education have more Alzheimer's disease because maybe there were other things that influenced their risk of Alzheimer's disease and also influenced their chances of pursuing more education. So if we can't run a proper experiment, what can we do? Natural experiments. So natural experiments happen all the time, and they're an incredible opportunity to understand how social context influences health and provide rigorous evidence on whether particular interventions might improve population health. In the United States, and in fact in nearly all high-income countries in the last century, we ran a huge natural experiment in which we moved a lot of people through um, increasing levels of education. This is just a picture from work by the economist Claudia Golden. And it shows you from um, essentially the beginning of the 20th century through um, the middle of the 20th century how much high school graduation rates increased. These are for white students um, across the century. And what you can see is very quickly, very quickly starting after World War I, we had rapid increases in, in um, high school attainment. That happened in the United States uh, earlier than, than most European countries. And you can see the little dip where World War II happened <clears throat> and then went up. Um, there was de, de jure racial segregation of schools and um, uh, this pattern was delayed for African, -American, African Americans until later in the century but you can see similar patterns if you look at African Americans. Why did this happen? Well, there were lots of social reasons, but the good news is that one reason it happened is that states changed their laws about how much schooling people were required to attend. And so this shows you just for one state, South Carolina, 
what happened across the course of the century um, to the number of years they required students to attend school. So at the beginning of the century, they actually only required students to attend six years of school. So students could begin school at age seven and then leave at age 13. And, but states, all states since around 1915 have had laws regulating when children needed to enter school and how early they could drop out of school or start working instead of going to school. And nearly all states changed those laws over the course of the 20th century, just like South Carolina. And what, you can, what you'd expect is that if education actually improves health, the people who were born and had to go to school under the longer regime that, that South Carolina required would have better health over the long run. They went to school longer, they got more school, not because of anything they chose or because of things, other things that might have influenced them, but because that's what the state law said. So we can use that as an opportunity to see whether health actually does have these benefits over the long run. So that's what we did. We took advantage of these legal, these policy changes that occurred all over the United States and education is very decentralized in the United States, so every state has its own set of, of laws. Um, so you can see all these states are running their own little natural experiments on, um, by changing the mandatory schooling. We took advantage of those policy changes, and we, by, we compared the cognitive outcomes decades later for kids born, um, say, before and after an increase in mandatory schooling in South Carolina or Illinois or New York or Colorado. Um, and we, to see whether or not those educational increases that were mandated by the policies actually uh, translated into health improvements for those people, those same people affected. Um, now, you might say, hold on, I think that there's a difference between those places anyway. The people who were born in places that don't have, don't require much schooling, there might be lots of other things about those places that influence their health. So it's not really the schooling per se. How can you know that it's about the mandatory schooling? Well, that's exactly why we don't just compare people, say, born in South Carolina to people born in Illinois. We compare people born in South Carolina before and after the policy change to people born in Illinois before and after the policy change in Illinois. And that way we can control for anything that's really consistently different about South Carolina or different about Illinois. And we can also control for things that happened over the course of the century that would have affected everybody throughout the country. So we basically uh, use those double comparisons or difference in difference approaches to identify something that's really happening around the time of the policy change in education. So we think it's about education, not about other things that might differ. So <clears throat> what do we actually see? Um, this is a little side lesson in how to present your results to make impactful science because I'm going to show you what I published. This is work that um, I did some years ago, and it's a really boring, visually unappealing table. And what it shows you is, yes, fantastic news. Those education policies protected older adults decades later. This was a study done in people who were on average 65 when we did the cognitive assessments. So if that number is it plays out, what you'd imagine is, uh, okay, about 0.2 standard deviation improvements in cognition in one year, 0.4 in two years. You can see that you could really have uh, an important improvement in cognition and protection against dementia uh, if you increased everybody's education. And so that was a table that I made. And here's a picture that I'll actually show you because this work was replicated in the United Kingdom. And uh, this is work from Banks in Mazona that they published. The United Kingdom had it major policy change in which they changed the mandated, um, uh, they increased the age at which children could stop school. And it had a huge impact on how much education people completed. Now in the United States, all of the states did it, but we didn't enforce the laws that much. It had a little bit of an increase on when we changed the laws. In the UK, when they changed their education policy, they took it seriously. And what you can see is a major decrease in the number of children dropping out before age 14 for both men and women in that slide. So what do we expect for cognition? Did this influence the cognition of these individuals decades later? Now, of course, you don't expect it to be as large as the impact on education because it has to go through all of those mechanisms. But when they plotted the cognition of people who were, again, average age 65 when they did these assessments, you still see this impact, this small impact on their average um, cognition. And they found results that were very similar to what we found in the United States. And now similar studies have been done in many other places.
So now I've given you a frame of the kinds of questions that we struggle with with uh, epidemiology and social epidemiology. So how do we use computational tools? Well, of course, all of epidemiology is pretty data intensive. And as we've had new computational tools and new data sources, we actually can do a lot of new um, types of studies and have new insights into the determinants of disease. One of the ways that that's playing out is really to um, use simulation tools to understand sources of bias that we otherwise couldn't really get a, get a grasp on. And I'm going to walk through one example of a simulation model that was developed as a pretty uh, straightforward simulation that is being used to solve a problem that we really had no other way to grapple with. And this uh, is led by my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Rose Maeda, who's an assistant professor at UCLA. Um, and she was interested in the problem of racial disparities in stroke. It turns out that in the United States, African Americans have about twice the risk of stroke as um, whites. And uh, that, but that disparity changes as people get older. And um, when you look at uh, young people, the uh, disparity is quite large. And then when you, when you look at people, it gets smaller and smaller in relative terms as people get, as you look at older and older age groups. And then above age 80, actually, African Americans who survive to age 80 without a stroke have a lower risk of stroke each year compared to whites of the same age. So why is that happening? One explanation for why that's happening might be selective survival. African Americans who survive to age 80 are really exceptional individuals. They've experienced a lot of adversity and come through a lot of um, threats to the, their health. Um, and mortality by age 80 from all kinds of causes is much higher for African Americans than whites in the United States. Another explanation, which is sometimes offered, is Actually, the sources of racial inequality in health really d diminish after age 65 when people become eligible for Medicare. The situation for older African Americans might just be actually better than for younger African Americans, and so the disparity narrows. Those are totally different explanations, and it's really important that we distinguish because one of them says, hey, we're doing okay for older African Americans, and the other one says, We've already killed everyone who is vulnerable, and we're not necessarily doing any better. We just can't see what adversity work is happening. So um, how can we actually address that, that problem? We've adopted this uh, set of tools based on simulation to say, can we explain the pattern that we see with the process of selective mortality? And so Dr. Mayada has developed a simulation that says, let's imagine even a, a, a modest selection process with differential mortality applied to a birth cohort, and we've shaped the birth cohort based on the US census data for an early birth cohort, applying the mortality rates that we actually see and assuming that there are underlying causes of mortality that we haven't observed, and differentially um, uh, introducing mortality across each successive year of age. What happens with the stroke patterns? And we can iterate that across um, thousands and thousands of iterations to see what pattern we see over, over um, each iteration. Mm -hmm. So what we see here is a distribution of her results. Now, she simulated this assuming that the effective race on stroke risk is exactly constant at every age from 20 to 100. And at each age, uh, a small fraction of people have stroke or die from other causes. And so after um, you get into the oldest ages, do you see changes in the association between race and stroke uh, in those oldest age groups, even under a simulated model where there actually is no difference in what the causal effect is? And what you can see here across her simulations is you see a market in, um, change in the oldest group. The red line here would indicate that there was no, no change. And the yellow dots, which you can see, is that across many, many iterations, those differences um, are pretty consistently observed in the oldest group. And that's entirely due to bias. Um, and the severity of the bias really depends on what fraction of people die before we're assessing this. So if you look at older and older age groups, a larger and larger fraction of people have died before we're doing the assessment. So the first slide is showing when only 25% of the birth cohort has died. And the second slide is when half of the birth cohort has died. And you can see that as you increasingly impose additional mortality, i.e. look at older and older age groups, you see a larger and larger bias just due to selective mortality. And in fact, when you look at those, iterate, those um, simulations, it's very easy to reproduce, just with bias, the patterns that look almost exactly like what we actually see in national stroke data.
what this implies is that it's n probably not that we have made, um, uh, we have eliminated the sources of, of health inequalities by race in older adults. It's more that we have the selective mortality process that is um, leaving the, remain the survivors as an extremely selected and very healthy bunch. And therefore, we can no longer detect the ways that we are, we are that African Americans experience differential threats to their health. So this is the kind of tool that really would not have been computationally feasible even a few decades ago, but now is pretty straightforward to, to implement and can be adopted into any standard um, epidemiologic analysis to quantify likely sources of bias. Um, so I want to end by just saying a little bit more about epidemiology. This is the kind of work we do on lots of different um, uh, diseases and outcomes. And I think of epidemiology as where statistics, sociology, and biology meet in order to improve public health. And epidemiology can make an incredible difference. This is a picture showing trends in deaths attributable to cardiovascular disease in the United States go over the last um, 70 years. And what you can see is a remarkable decline. And every little blip on that indicates a lot of humans who did not have, um, did not die of heart disease. So in, in 1950, mortality from heart disease was um, 589 per 100,000, but by 2013, it had dropped to 170. That is a huge in improvement. Very good news. So we actually accomplished that via many mechanisms, many of them related to both delivering medical care, but also related to behavioral mechanisms like smoking, reduce reductions in smoking via taxation or and uh, indoor smoking bans, lots of, lots of really a multi-pronged strategy brought down cardiovascular disease mortality was such an incredible success. What are the next big challenges? This is a picture of what we anticipate is going to happen with Alzheimer's disease if we don't find ways to prevent or cure the disease. But maybe we can do the same as we did with cardiovascular disease and find ways to bring that curve down. Um, I want to end by thanking people who have contributed slides or ideas, um, and we have a textbook on social epidemiology if you're interested in social epidemiology in particular, and uh, these are a few of my wonderful PhD students in the epi program at UCSF, and thanks a lot.